Greetings everyone, and today I'm very excited to be checking out something real special. It's a lens that I've been curious about testing for absolutely years, and now that Canon cameras are coming out with in-body image stabilization, it's also a lens that's becoming more relevant. This is the Canon EF 200mm f1.8 L USM known by some geekier photographers as the Eye of Sauron, although not by me, I'm not really into Lord of the Rings. When Canon launched their shiny new EF lens mount system back in the late 80s, its large size and autofocus capability was state of the art, eventually going on to win a lot of the professional market over from Nikon, and one of Canon's killer lenses for sports photographers was this monster, the brightest 200mm lens ever made. Oh my goodness, this was a fun lens for me to test out, just look at these images. Canon discontinued this lens a long time ago, as the lead used in the production of its giant glass elements was not environmentally friendly, and it was replaced by a slightly smaller 200mm f2 lens, which is a little sharper and has image stabilisation. But if your camera has its own in-body image stabilisation, then this lens will have you pirouetting in joy with its gorgeous out of focus backgrounds for portrait pictures and excellent capability for indoor sports photography. You can find these lenses in various states of repair for between three and four thousand US dollars over on eBay, or about two and a half to three and a half thousand pounds here in the UK. Canon no longer repair this lens, so make sure to get a decent copy, otherwise you'll have to look around for someone else to fix any problems it might develop, which could be expensive. I'd like to say a huge thank you to Joe Warner for trusting me enough to lend me his copy of this spectacular lens for a few weeks for evaluation. His own photography skills, especially for wildlife work, are out of this world, so definitely check out his Vero page down in the description below. Let's get down to business. As you can see, the lens is certainly big, but not unmanageable. Less encouraging is its heavy weight of three kilos, or over six and a half pounds. The lens is certainly hand-holdable, but after a while your arms will really begin to ache, which is probably why Canon originally included a shoulder strap for the lens. The lens does not appear to be weather sealed, although there is room in there to use Canon's 1.4x and 2x extenders if you want to. Despite its age, it has a lot of features you'd see on a modern Canon Super Telephoto L lens. There's a rear filter holder, although it's difficult to get replacement ones nowadays. Alongside the usual focus limiter controls, there is a focus preset button, which works in conjunction with the white, spring-loaded preset control ring. In this older copy of the lens, it's gotten a bit stiff, though. The lens's rubberized focus ring is electronically connected to the focus motor, which was a little unusual 35 years ago, but you'll be really pleasantly surprised by how responsively it works when your camera is turned on. Here you can see that the lens exhibits considerable focus breathing, zooming in noticeably as you focus more closely to your subject. A nice feature which I found useful in my testing was the manual focus speed control switch. Here's some footage manually focusing on the slowest, speed 1, and now speed 2, and here is the fastest, speed 3, which is very responsive. The lens's autofocus motor is pretty fast, although not up to the height of the newest Canon lenses. I found it focused quite accurately when adapted onto my EOS R5 camera. Also, when it comes to noise, the motor is quiet when in movement, but a bit noisy when stopping and starting, particularly when micro-adjusting, so that's something to bear in mind. I mentioned already that this lens does not feature its own image stabilisation, but for anyone interested, I'd like to show you what your image looks like on a camera with in-body image stabilisation, like my EOS R5. Here's some footage without stabilisation, and now with it turned on. It's helping quite a lot, but there's still quite some wobble in there. In-body stabilisation doesn't tend to work so well at telephoto focal lengths, to be honest, so this is one area where the newer 200mm f2 version of the lens will have a tiny advantage. The lens's metal tripod collar is very firm and easily adjustable, no issues there. The lens also comes with its own carry trunk, something that's highly protective and pretty useful, although ultimately there isn't room in there to also carry a camera, which would have been helpful. 
The lens comes with a deep white hood, as well as a leather lens cap, which is hard at the front, which does a good job of protecting the lens, but is naturally a bit fiddly to get on and off. The front of the lens has a rubber trim to reduce damage from knocks and bumps. Unsurprisingly, that huge front element does not have a thread for attaching filters. Overall, the lens's build quality is solid as a rock, and there's very little difference here from a modern Super Telephoto L lens. Boy, is it a bit heavy to carry around with you, though. Alright, image quality. This lens may be a 35-year veteran, but that's not going to stop me starting by challenging it with a demanding 45-megapixel full-frame sensor of a Canon EOS R5 camera. In-camera corrections, unfortunately, are not available with this lens. At f1.8, straight away, we see very high contrast and great sharpness in the middle of the image, although it's not razor sharp here. The good news though is that corner image quality is just as good, there's no degradation, although without the availability of in-camera corrections, some colour fringing is noticeable on contrasting edges. Let's stop the lens down to f2.8. In the corners we see just a little more brightness, and razor sharp image quality now, and back in the middle, unsurprisingly, we see razor sharpness again. The lens stays this sharp down to f11, although it's top down as far as f16, and things look softer due to diffraction. Ultimately though, for a groundbreaking 35 year old lens on such a high resolution camera, this is an awesome performance. It's still not quite as sharp as its successor though, the 200mm f2. Anyway, let's challenge the lens even further by mounting it onto my Canon EOS R7 with its 32.5 megapixel smaller APS-C sized sensor. At f1.8, things aren't quite so rosy anymore, contrast remains quite good but resolution is just acceptable. Thankfully, the corner image sharpness is still just as good, although that colour fringing is a bit more pronounced by the denser image sensor. The good news though, is that if you stop down to f2.8, you'll see fantastic sharpness both in the corners and back in the middle. The lens stays this sharp down to f11, where diffraction is noticeably affecting sharpness on the denser APS-C image sensor. So it's only on one of the most demanding sensors currently available that the 200mm f1.8 finally begins to show its age a little bit. But then again, only really at f1.8, this is still a good performance overall, all things considered. Ok, let's go back to full frame now and take a look at distortion and vignetting. As I mentioned before, in-camera corrections are not available with this lens unfortunately, even with my fully updated EOS R5 camera. But in fairness, vignetting and distortion are not much of a problem. The only thing really notable is some corner shading here, but it falls so very gently across the image frame that you barely ever notice it in real world shooting. It is reduced at f2.8, and at f4 it's pretty much gone. Now, let's see about close-up image quality, a serious weakness of the tested lens unfortunately, as this thing can only focus down to 2.5 meters, making it a very poor choice for shooting smaller subjects. At f1.8, close-up image quality is just a little softer than at normal distances, however, stop down to f2.8 and that great sharpness is back again. Now, let's see about its performance against bright light. Considering its gigantic glass elements and the age of its design, I was expecting serious problems here, but actually the lens's contrast remains formidably strong. However, bright lights in the picture do produce some pointed flaring. This lens can give you some of the most strongly diffused backgrounds in your images available today. But what do those backgrounds actually look like? Well, I'm really pleased to tell you that this lens's bokeh is beautifully soft in almost all situations. Specular highlights don't have any noticeable substructure problems, although there is, unsurprisingly, a cat's eye shape to highlights in your image corners. When DP Review tested this lens on their own YouTube channel, they had some problems with the quality of their lens's bokeh when the aperture was topped down, but as you can see here, I was unable to replicate them on my own copy of the lens. And finally, related to bokeh comes longitudinal chromatic aberration. More good news here, it's noticeable at f1.8 but really quite low, and stop down to f2.8 and it's pretty much gone. Nice! 
Overall, well, good old Canon clearly over-engineered this thing because its optics are way better than the 35mm film cameras of the time would really have needed, and it performs formidably well even on a modern 45 megapixel digital camera. And just look at those images it can produce. Even in 2023, the lens's look is as fresh and vibrant as it is unique. I loved testing this lens, but if you were to ask me which lens to pursue, this or its successor, the slightly darker 200mm f2 lens that came out 20 years later in 2008, then I'd have to say the newer lens to be honest. It's a little smaller and lighter, it's noticeably sharper, it has image stabilisation and it has a closer minimum focus distance, not to mention the fact that as a much newer lens it's less likely to break down and will be a little easier to have fixed, oh, probably. But still, there's just something about shooting at 200mm and f1.8, there really is. The lens's images are simply mind-blowing, it optically performed better than I thought it would, and so, if you can find a good copy, this lens still has to come highly recommended. The Sig Monster, the Magic Drain Pipe, the Eye of Sauron, all these crazy names we make up for hideously expensive camera lenses, honestly, we should just call them the Overdraft Pusher, or the Wife Enrager, or the Chiropractor's Nightmare. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this review. If you find these videos helpful, then check out my Patreon page, where supporters get all kinds of exclusive bonus content and help to keep these reviews trucking on. Ciao for now, everyone.